Oh, the calendar is too much. Today is September 28, 2011. Wow, it's been working way too hard. Mm -hmm. Lost track of time. It is the first of Tishri. Uh, tishri, is it something in a box that you clean your nose with and wipe your eyes? No, 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 no. All right, so what's the day of celebration that is for the nation of Israel today? Somebody call it out. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Rosh Hashanah meaning what? Does anybody know? It, it is trumpets, but the literal translation of Rosh Hashanah. It head means of the year. head of the year, beginning, or New Year's Eve. So tell me a little bit. Uh, wait, let me give the title. The title for today's, ser today's sermon is Wake Up Call. There we go. Now we can go. So Rosh Hashanah begins the, the new year. Well, something that we do every single day is something called a wake-up call. Most of us do every day. What do we usually have that helps us get out of our bed? Alarm. 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 Okay. Very good. We'll do a couple of things here. John, if you could activate that podium, I mean the sound input from up here. Oh, no. You got it? So every morning, my wife just absolutely loves to hear something like, is it coming through? Yeah. I wouldn't even have to mic it. I wouldn't have to mic it? How about this? Wait, hold on. Hey, that came through. Let me try this again. And, or something like, well, look at my wife. Everybody look at my wife right now. She is repulsed. And one of the main reasons why is because I will let it go off for about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> but she's the one that helps get me up, so she's honestly my wake-up call. Uh, some of the other ones I absolutely love, and uh, Mom, this reminds me of you. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <laughs> but the best of all is uh, this one. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Okay, then that's enough. Of that. No, <laughs> be quiet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Those phones are crazy. If anybody doesn't know who that character is, that's Brack. B R A K. Get on YouTube, look it up. It's absolutely hilarious. Anyway, a couple of things we have instilled in our culture help us have a routine, get up, and go somewhere. And usually, wake up calls are waking you up from sleep. Is sleep good? Yes. But only at certain times, right? Yes. All right. So everybody turn to Leviticus 23. There. There. Is that right close? Yes. There. 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 Leviticus is right next to Revelation. No. <laughs> I'm leading y'all astray already, I'm sorry. All right, Leviticus 23, 23. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, on the first day of the seventh month, you have to have a day of rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Now, with the exception of one other occurrence, I believe, in Exodus, uh, that's about all Israel got to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. There's some other traditions, other things that you would do, but when you're viewing these feasts, you do not view them one in and of them by themselves. So, who was uh, with us about a year ago, a year and a half ago, when we were in the other building? So, roughly about 60%. Do you guys remember this? When I came to the far side of the room, I said the first feast is? Well, I'm sorry. You... I have one of those asthma things if you need it. Passover. There we go. Passover. Next one. Eleven bread. Next one. First fruits. Next one. Feast of weeks are commonly known as? Pentecost. Shavuot. Then what next thing would I do? Way over here, Rosh Hashanah. So within the first month, or first two months, you had the first four feasts. Going into the, the seventh month began the next feast. All of these 
were seen by Israel as a repetitive holy convocation. Now, for those of you who may not be well churched or familiar with biblical terms, convocation is something that is a holy act or religious festival that is repeated year after year after year. For those of you with some of the more uh, Mary-ish kind of backgrounds, you're very familiar with convocations. We do those all the time. When God instituted these elements of Rosh Hashanah, it wasn't uh, just for the pure standpoint of wanting them to be repetitious and therefore fulfill, fulfill an act, and an act alone would be a source of righteousness. But why is it that we repeat things, guys? If I looked at my child and I looked at Natalie and said, Natalie, don't touch the oven. Natalie, don't touch the oven. Natalie, don't touch the oven. Is it that I don't want her to grow up to learn how to cook? No. No. When she gets a certain age, please touch the oven, turn the knobs on, cook something good, I'm hungry. <laughs> the whole intent at certain ages and levels is to preserve life. If there's ever a central focal point of whenever you read any part of the word and you don't understand it, a very good place to start is what is God's intent? And his intent is always to preserve life. Amen. So if I come back to here, let's reread Leviticus 23, 23. The Lord said to Moses, well, where was Moses at this point in time? Moses was in the desert with the nation of Israel, a band of people who only knew their identity as slaves. And he was up on top of the mountain receiving instruction from God. The one thing in preserving life for you and what that looks like in your daily life is that you will not understand the commands, the requirements, and the decrees of the living God if you are not dwelling within His presence. Moses received the law, the life-giving law that preserved life because he was willing to go into God's presence. Amen. He responded to God's call. Say to the Israelites, on the first day of the seventh month, you would have a day of rest. Now when we say day of rest or something that would sound like a Sabbath, that should ring some bells of words that you read in Genesis. And on the seventh day, God rested. Each part of each week, each month, each year, each festival, God would always command the, the nation of Israel to rest. Because every single time they rehearsed, 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 they were to stop and reflect on who God was, but more so that promise of the day of rest that is still to come. Amen. When sin will no longer reign and the work of our hands will be complete from end to end. How much do you guys look forward to the weekend? A bunch. Unless you work on the weekend. <laughs> but for most of us, we look forward to it. In fact, there's a wonderful book out now called Everyday Friday. <laughs> but my viewpoint in the Word is, honestly, every day, except for Sunday, or the Sabbath, is a work day. Every day is to put our hands and our feet to mimic exactly what God did. And that means, means for six days, He spoke His word and actions follow. Does that begin to echo inside of you? Six days out of every week, you are to put your feet to action, your hands to work with the things that God has put directly in front of you. And see them as a holy convocation, a repetition of God's character. And on the seventh day, you rest from your work and you admire the wonders of His. A sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blast. Now, as far as I can know, uh, during this time period that, that Moses and the whole nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt, they didn't necessarily have a brass section. So a lot of times our English language fails us. Because I'm serious, for a long time I said trumpet blast, I literally thought of the English horns that stood out 12 feet. And they, you know, something to a tune of, uh, you know, the Holy Grail. 
with Monty Python. <laughs> but more so, it would look something like this. Something small, rather insignificant. These were later introduced uh, as time went on. But this was very common. Because what was it attached to at one point? Ram. The king of the sheep. Now, for the most part, uh, they were agriculturalists. They raised livestock. And they worked the ground. It's kind of a simple way of life that you know, I would thoroughly enjoy for moments in my life. But interacting with these king of the sheep, these were the guys that would dominate all others. That would vie for this competition and eventually establish a stronghold. When you read throughout the word and you see the word, the horn of salvation, or in Revelation, seven horns popped up, then one exalted itself above all the others. It's not talking about a literal horn coming out of the ground. It's talking about someone who was kingly or who took authority. The unique thing about this is that the ram had to give it up. And I'm sure he didn't just detach it and hand it over to the shepherd. But if I'm reading here, let's read between the lines, that I'm to commemorate a day, a sacred assembly to the Lord with trumpet blast, what's one of the key elements that I have to have in my hand? A trumpet. Therefore, I must have a ram that is available to give it up. The parallel line that you begin to draw is that the feasts of the Lord are unfulfilled without sacrifice. That when the king of the sheep gave up his stronghold and his authority, it enabled us to participate in the repetitious convocations of commune with our God. It was removed from his head. The flesh was stripped out. And the last final thing that makes a trumpet a trumpet is the ruach, the breath of God, is breathed through it and for the sole purpose of sounding a call. Now there's something unique about Rosh Hashanah, or commonly known as Yom Tehurah, ruach, the breath is that in this feast, there was a long period of time, you saw the steps that I took from one side of the, the, the room to the other. This long awaited time between meeting together with your family, your friends, your distant relatives, your entire tribe, because that's how you would assemble. And you would all get together and feast. There would be food. There would be singing. There would be dancing. But all of this in its right order. Now, the month before it is called Elom. Now, what became common tradition is that as you would travel from how many ever miles it may be, a distant land, this Yom, uh, Yom Kippur was one of the commanded feasts annually you were to come to Jerusalem. And as you would begin to make your way, you would arrive there ten days early and participate in Rosh Hashanah. Now how long would it take to walk from right here, Belknap Road, to let's say town center? It's roughly about seven miles. Seven miles an hour is a pretty brisk pace. Now add kids and add, add livestock. You may go three miles per hour. So on average, Pending no diaper changes or vomiting or anything else. It may take you about two or two and a half hours just to go a short distance. Now, imagine you had to travel from El Paso to here. A great distance travel will also show a great commitment to remain faithful to what the Lord has asked you to do. The Lord has asked you to participate in His feast, something He has stamped as part of your identity of who you are. But there's a great distance to get there. There's a great sacrifice. Wouldn't you treat that sacrifice of what you're giving, but also what others are giving, as something that's holy and acceptable to the Lord? Yes. It's about the journey almost more than it is about the actual landing place. And during that journey, what would happen? In that month of Elul, it was 30 days, because it's a lunar calendar, that you would travel. I'm sure you would have hardships. You would have bandits. You would have to deal with food and ends and all those kind of things. 
But what became a common practice is that you would begin to reflect on your life. Because for the first 10 days, starting tonight, that sundown, first 10 days you would begin to reflect on you. But not from a self-centered perspective. It's with the sole intent of am I right with God and am I right with men? Because once again, aside from our American appeal of individuality, what you were coming to do as an Israelite is to join all Israel, stand as one complete nation before the Lord, and have one representative go into the presence of God, and you would wait. You would wait to see if the Lord was presenting acceptable sacrifice and a cleansing of sins for the entire nation. What if you were that one person standing in that crowd that you know you lived in a distant land. No one could see the sin that you did or continue to do throughout the whole year. But standing there, it was your fault that Israel didn't get cleansed from their sins that year and judgment was coming. But the next year you would spend being persecuted thrown out, exiled to Babylon or Assyria, experiencing famine, death of your newborns or even your children. And you knew that it was because of you. And it not just affected you, but the neighbors next to you who experienced the same thing. Experiencing that one time on what your sin and the death that it causes to those around you. You think you would have a little bit different mindset walking that distance to your, uh, Rosh Hashanah the next year, you would begin to evaluate your life and make sure that you are right with God and right with men. Saints, our sin doesn't affect us and us alone. Our sin affects everyone else around us. When we begin to worship, every worship service, I try not to magnify it or throw Jonah from the boat, but if someone walks in here and grieves the Spirit of God with their sin, His trumpet won't blow. His Spirit will not move through the ram's authority and give a clear call of how to proceed into the presence of the Lord. Repentance precedes power, always. But God's grace was that He gave you ten days to reflect. He gave you 10 days to offer sacrifice. He gave you 10 days to evaluate yourself and go make it right. We should be quick to repent and slow to sin. One of the practices that evolved from this, from tradition, is that during these 10 days, as they were feasting, because they really view this uh, like the Rosh Hashanah term deems as head of the year. They participate in it like we do our New Year. Now, you guys have been to my house at one point or another during New Year's. And trust me, we never have a shortage of food. Mm -hmm. There's good things. I mean, it seems it's potluck on steroids. <laughs> John, I love that Vietnamese beef you bring every single year. Amen. That makes it right. My mom made some jalapeno poppers that kept my bathroom busy. <laughs> Everyone always brings a special delight and a treat. And honestly, when we think of Christmas, when we think of Thanksgiving, when we think of New Year's, food plays a very central part to this. It's part of the memory, part of the senses. What we do with the preschool kids is that we hand them treats. We hand them uh, jelly beans or M&Ms. And we get them to recite to us, the word of God is as sweet as honey. Do it about another octave up. Honey. 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 That's what they say. And the whole reason is, is that that moment in preschool, for roughly three years of their life, maybe four, there's a convocation. There's a repetitious action that they associate God's word. What some people deem as untrustworthy, just a book among many, or just maybe a way to live, not the way to live. But what we ingrain in these children is that it, it is the way to live. It is the sweetest thing of life that they are to cherish and praise it. 
God did the same thing. Within the, the Israel, uh, culture of Israel, when their children began school, they had slates that they would use chalk on to write and learn their ABCs or Aleph Bets. But they would first put honey on it and they would draw the letters with their fingers. Mm. Now granted, it's a mess worth cleaning up. But children and something sweet in front of them all over their hands, where do you predict it will go next? Oh, Hopefully. <laughs> Maybe like my girls with pancakes and syrup, they'll first end up in their hair. <laughs> But it goes in their mouth. And their first interaction with the Word of God, with the language that the Word of God is written in, is something sweet. Rosh Hashanah was no different. They would take apples, something that would come into bloom that year, and harvest it for the fall. They would slice them up, and they would dip them in honey. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> As they would dip them in honey, it would be a somber feel. That as you're reflecting on your own sin and getting right with God, but now the entire nation of Israel is coming together. And whatever grievances you had against one fellow man or another, now was the time to make it sweet. Now was the time to preserve life. If there's ever one thing, saints, that can keep you out of the presence of God quicker than anything else, it's unforgiveness. Let me bring this home. Husbands, wives, if ever you have a discussion, what would I like to call it that? That's sweet. That's the honey part of it. The bitter part of it is it's a fight. Whenever you have grievances between one another, solve it before the sun goes down, before the next day, so that the Spirit of God is not grieved, and like the Word says in 1 Corinthians, your prayers are not in you. Once again, keeping you outside the presence of God, like the high priest, not being able to fulfill his commitment at Yom Kippur. Now, another thing they would do, they would make these breads with raisins and with all these sweet things. Everything was centered around this sweet element. But the one thing that would kick it off, beginning on that first day, was a trumpet blast. And as this trumpet would sound, everyone's ears would perk up. And they would know this now, now begins the time that we have a set point to get right with God. You better evaluate. I don't know, this kind of sounds like going throughout your entire home and looking for yeast. This sounds like doing a self-inspection and inventory like the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Where you would go and you would gather up anything that would cause you to be outside the will of God. At that point in time, to have leaven in your home. And they would ball it up and wrap it inside of a cloth. And at that night, they would burn it in the fire. They would get rid of the old. And then they would receive a new batch of yeast for the whole new year. At the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The idea of this repetition of old coming out, new coming in, is repeated now again at Rosh Hashanah. That with this trumpet blast, it was the sounding of the old leaving out. And once Yom Kippur was fulfilled and the nation of Israel was covered for their sins, it immediately became a festive time. And they began with this new re renewal, this sense of right with God. And they would celebrate it with joy and festivals inside of Sukkot, or temporary dwellings. Now, let me break down the call, because the title of this message is Wake Up Call, not Wake Up Honey. But that can't be said in the morning as well. That's a sweet way. <laughs> the word call in Hebrew is kara, Q-A-R-A. -A. And it breaks down in several different ways. To call out, to recite, or to call out loudly. It's used throughout the entire word. Basically, any time that you see the word call, more than likely, likely it's going to be this verb, this action. But I want to make something very clear. It's not as if you're receiving a nice little tone on your cell phone. Oh, something's calling me. I must go attend it now. Or it can wait. 
the majority of the time the word call is used, it's a forceful summons. Now, if I walked up to, let's say, uh, I'll pick Bob. Bob's a nice guy, he can take this. If I walked up to Bob and I said, Bob, you're a nice guy, but I'm going to change your name. It's going to be Hank. You'll cease to be Bob, you shall be Hank. You think Bob would take kindly to that? Not so much. That's his name. His father gave it to him. That defines who he is and his function. But what I just did by renaming him or recalling him, I just redefined who he was. I showed an authority over the existence of Bob. Right? The first day of creation, what did God create? Let there be light. Now, our English language fails us a little bit again. But in that, that paraphrase or that, that element after he separated the light from darkness, it says, and God called the light day. This was the very first implication of using this word kara. And it meant that God showed and exerted his authority and dominion over this presence. And that he is, his word dominated and showed his sovereignty. And that he could call it to its own function. And what else did he do? Throughout the remainder of the days, he called things into being. He spoke his word and things came out of the ground. Waters were separated. Beasts or uh, fish were made in the sea and beasts were made from the land. And he called to the dust of the earth and he created man. And he breathed his Ruach HaKodesh in it. And out of all creation, that God's word, his calling, that loud, forceful element, there's only one part of creation that he gave the authority to call something else by its name. And that was Adam. Adam's mission, or commission, was that the Lord brought all of the animals in front of him, and he named them. Or a more proper way is that he called them. He called them by their function. So now we have a tier of fit. God exerting his authority over all dominion and showing its sovereignty over it. And now God gave that same authority to Adam and he exerted the same thing over creation. So what does that have to do with Rosh Hashanah? I don't know. I'm kind of getting there. No. <laughs> it builds. The word kara in a noun sense can mean a holy convocation. In fact, some of you guys have heard us say the word mikra. What this mikra is, is a repetitive religious festival that was to commemorate a feast of the Lord, but was initiated with a loud call. I want everybody to close their eyes and imagine you're sleeping. And as you're sleeping, you're kind of going to that break at 5.30 in the morning and you're waiting for that alarm to go off. And you're getting to that lying place of sleep where you're not sure if it's going to go off just yet, but you want to sleep a little bit more. Ooh. <laughs> Is everybody's BPM at about 120 now? <laughs> that was pretty weak at first, but it kind of made its effect. Immediately your heart races and you jump up to action, correct? Whenever this call was sounded at Rosh Hashanah, when it was sounded just within the culture of Israel, it had that same effect. It should startle you, it should rouse you, it should make you get to your feet and be alert that something is at hand. Don't be lazy. <clears throat> Look up and pay attention. The Lord is doing something. Saint is it. There's ever a time in our culture now, spiritually, but also within our, our dominion of America, there's a call that's being blasted forward. And that call is to repentance. There's no doubt in my mind that even though these feasts are set for Israel, they are definitely the pattern that happened for us as well. Whether we are Gentile or Jew. Amen. That if this was the pattern that not only God 
acted in in Genesis when creating the entire universe, then gave to Adam, and then again and again and again displayed this repetitious pattern of a long spirit of lull and then a blast of call for God's people to collect, assemble, stand before him, salvation would come, and then they would receive a new dwelling. Does that sound familiar? As we open our ears and open our eyes, but more importantly, the ears of our hearts and our spirits, and we listen to what God's call is trying to say, and we repent for whatever grievances that we have towards God or towards one another, or prevent them from coming in, it's then and only then that we can clearly be alert to what the Lord wants to do next. Let's switch this up a little bit. I know if I ask right now, how many of you in this room believe you have a call from the Lord to do something? You have a calling. Yeah, raise your hands if you feel like you do. What that should be is a repetitious, loud proclamation of what God is designing to do. But the only way that you're able to hear it is when you stand in His presence and you let His Spirit move through you. Every person in this room has a, dy a dynamic and an element that the kingdom of God needs. Now, can the kingdom of God move forward if I become bitter and fall away and go somewhere else? Yes, it can. But you know what it will do? It will hinder it happening now. That's the difference. I am replaceable. But the time that I stand in is not. Now is the time to get right with God. Because a missed opportunity means that God has to wait a little bit longer to accomplish his overall plan. It will be accomplished, but it's delayed. And do you want to stand before the living God and it be your fault that God's will didn't get done in that moment? No, I don't want to be. So what does this look like in your life? As you begin to reflect and be alert for that call and listen to it, this means that whatever the Lord has put in front of you today, you are to act upon it. A lot of times we talk about the call and what we're supposed to do is this, you know, far, far away place that this, uh, this the end goal 10, 15 years from now. It's what we eventually will be. And all these obstacles are in my way preventing me from getting to that one point. You ever think that once again it's more about the journey of getting there besides just being there within that call? If I had 40 days to travel to go and celebrate, first of all, days of all repentance, then salvation for the whole community, and then celebrating a permanent dwelling that God would give us, that would give me ample time to reflect on anything I could be doing to hindering God's will from happening in my own life. What this looks like for us, saints, is worship services is a time when we all come together. And I can't stress to you how important it is. As blessings, as, as much of a blessing as a car is, sometimes it is a distraction because it gets us to church a little too quickly. <laughs> now, I still would like for you to get here on time. <laughs> Turn your radios off. Put your phones down on the way to church. Because you, do you want it to be your fault, your grievance or unforgiveness with somebody else who may be in this very building right now, the reason why we can't all enter into God's presence in the first song, why prophecy may be a struggle, why the word may come off a little bit flat? Because I can tell you, it is my mission, it is Eric's mission, that we do the exact same thing before every single service that we get right with the Lord, we make sure we get right with anybody else, I don't want to be an obstacle. There's a call to repent, saints. There's a call to get right. Now, if there's not a worship service to go to, 
if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If you find it getting in your way of getting into God's presence, act on it immediately. Waste no time. There's a short period of time to deal with sin. There's a short period of time to deal with grievances. And if what's been pressing on you is something that may seem major, but they said it to me like this, or I know when they told me this word or looked at me this certain way, I knew what was in, really in their heart was that they hated me or they thought I wasn't valuable enough. You cast it down and you run. You run into the presence of God. You run to that other person, but not like this. Watch stand up, JJ. I wouldn't come up to JJ and say, JJ, I want to do what Matt said. I just want to forgive you for really harming me and, and hurting all of my feelings. <laughs> all right, I'm good. Let's go worship. Don't forget you hated him for about five years. Yes, I hated you in my heart, but I didn't tell you for five years. <laughs> So, I knew it with God. Good luck with it, buddy. But more so, it looks like this. Because honestly, getting right with God and getting right with men essentially has to happen somewhat in that order so you can get right perspective. Repentance is not self centered. So, it looks like this. Yes, JJ, I am sorry. I acted like this. I didn't want to be a stumbling block to you. I'm sorry that I was. And I repent before God and before you and I ask for your forgiveness. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Repentance is sacrificial. And guess what will be that living sacrifice on the altar of the living God? Your flesh, your pride, your justification. Every little detail that you built up and built that wall and said, this is why I can be angry. This is why I can feel hurt. Because if you don't tear that wall down, God eventually will. And trust me, you're not going to like his process. I advise you to do it yourself. Amen. So from today, moving forward, I want you guys to search your hearts. Act as if you're walking to Jerusalem for Rosh Hashanah. That you're in that 10 days of all. Not examining your neighbor's sin, but examining your own. And whatever it is, realize there's a time clock on it and you need to get it right. Sin hardens hearts. And when there are calluses on fingers, when there's calluses on hearts, the details, the sensitivity is lost. You will not always be able to forgive. The ability to forgive is not just yours. You can grieve God's spirit long enough and he will be to begin to withdraw and that heart that was once sensitive to his thumping of, hey, go get this right with this person or, hey, get this right with me. It will no longer sense the Lord's direction. It will no longer sense that thumping. So what I want you to do is stand on your feet. Here was the goal of Rosh Hashanah, that it would have some form of somnolence, kind of like now. It feels kind of mellow, a little bit heavy, but it had that element of sweetness. And that sweetness is the hope. That as the nation of Israel would stand there, just like we're standing here, but much, much more, there was that hope that God would do something sweet. There was that hope that the high priest would come out and the sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel would be accepted and they could leap for joy and rejoice. Saints, there is that hope. There is that ability to repent. There is that ability to forgive. But first, we've got to hunt it down and find it and get rid of it. And I tell you, it's worth it. Say that with me. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. It's worth it. Join the hands of the person next to you. Mighty God, we thank you for your living word that is sharper than a double-edged sword. It divides our soul and spirit, our joint and marrow. 
and judges the attitude and the thoughts of our hearts. Lord, we pray that you open the eyes of our heart. Show us, Lord, the areas that we need to test you with, that we need to turn and bring back to you. Show us the areas that we are out of shalom with you and with our man, our, our brother. Show us, Lord, what you require of how to make things right and then be an acceptable sacrifice to you. Because, Lord, we long for the sweetness of your presence. We long for the sweetness of reconciliation with you and with our body, with our family. Because we know that when we are in unity with you and unity with others, Lord, we can shout it with one voice, great and mighty is the Lord. We can say we have received your salvation, your healing, and your covering. We thank you, Lord, for pouring your spirit into us and giving us your great and precious promises culminating in your son. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. In the mighty and awesome name of Jesus, we all say, Amen. 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 Lord, love somebody.